God is good. Amen. All the time. God is good. Everyone has their own favorites when it comes to music. Some people don't get into music. Some people think the service doesn't start till we're done singing. Some people think we could go on for another hour. Uh, different strokes for different folks, but worship is the key, the foundational thing. That song, Goodness of God, I could sing every week. And since I picked the songs, we decided. <laughs> but uh, God's really doing some incredible things here. Amen. He's using people to accomplish heavenly tasks. And if we were to try to do this in our own power, we could still have a service. Oh yes, we could go through emotions, we could sing songs, we could celebrate communion, we could take offerings, we could read scripture, we could do all that stuff. But boy, there's a big difference when you let the Holy Spirit lead and do what he wants to do. And that's why we're here. I'm not here to impress you. I'm certainly not here to impress you. The singers aren't here to impress you. Faye's not here to impress you as, as, as good as she makes that piano sound. Amen. Amen. And all of the people behind the scenes, they're running the, the sound and the cameras and all of that, they're not here to impress you. They're here to, to serve God. And <coughs> I, I like to think there's a difference. There's a noticeable difference when you just do things in a carnal way that doesn't always have to mean evil, it just means flesh. And when you let God have his way. Amen. And uh, I've stood at the front of, of a building like this for 40 years in different buildings mainly, the last 10 in one particular building. And uh, I'm sure there were days that I just got up and went through the motions. We all have days like that. But I, I never, ever, ever want to go through the motions. I'd soon stay home than go through the motions. And now that I'm over 60, I get to be crotchety about it. <laughs> and say, it's just, I just don't want it to happen. If God's not in it, I don't want to do it. I don't care how long we've done it or how good we are at it. If God's not in it, I don't want to do it. Amen. So we started last week looking at, uh, uh, taking a fresh look at our core values. And this week is number two. Our second core value, not in terms of importance or anything like that, just happens to be on the list. And that is, be the one. Step up and step out. And I almost put Jean's song in here today. Jean wrote a song, new lyrics to, she'll be coming around the mountain. But we'll do that some other time because I really wanted to, to kind of stress a point with this be the one, step up and step out, step out. Because the first thing you think of and what we have historically done is say, step right up and volunteer, right? Go ahead and be used for God. Find a way to get plugged in around here. Sign up for this, volunteer for that. And while that's good, I want to challenge that limitation this morning. I want to challenge that limitation with this, with this sentence. It's not what you do, it's who you are. And I'll take that even a step further. Answering God's call on your life is not always connected with what he wants you to do, but who he has created you to be. I'll put that up on the screen, I want to say that again. Next slide. Answering God's call upon your life is not always connected with what he wants you to do, but who he has created you to be. You know, there are tasks of ministry that an unsaved person could do. Right? Yes. You don't have to be saved to sing a song or play an instrument. You don't have to be saved to even stand at the front door and be nice to people. But if you're going to let God use you, you have to be a new creation. So it's not always connected with the do's. It starts out with the bees. So 
Once you understand who he has created you to be, the doing becomes clear. So let's, let's for a moment put aside all of the things that he's calling you to do. And let's think about the things that he's created us to be. Being is related to authority. Now, let me clarify authority. There is an authority with our government. The Bible says we are to be subject to the rulers. Sometimes that's a little hard for us to do, depending on the ruler. Or what tribe he is. It shouldn't be that way, but that's the way it is. Or the church. There's authority structure in the church. God has set it up that way. There, there kind of has to be that chain. And in the home. There's authority, a biblical authority structure in the home. But I'm talking about the authority of the believer. The authority that the believer has. Because that all goes into being. When you think about who he has recreated you to be, that, that, a lot of that has to do with what authority do we have as believers in Christ. In other words, what's our level of clearance? What can we, without stepping into divine territory that people have tried to do, what is it that God has created us to be? So, what doors are we authorized to open? Because there are some doors we're authorized to open. Maybe we've been left discouraged by people in the church who have thrown their weight around and, and become real bossy in the name of Jesus. Maybe to the point that we just kind of back off and say, well, I'll just be kind of passive when it comes to spiritual things. But that's not what God intends for us. To, to simply be passive and let the, the leadership of the local church do everything is not what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And there again, I'm not even talking about doing things. I'm talking about being. So let's, we're going to look at authority today and, and, and help that, let that inform us of what it means to be the one, to step up and step out. You'll see in your bulletins there are some inserts. And they have the scriptures. It's going to be an awful lot of scripture uh, in, in the message. And to get you to, to follow it around, is, you're just going to be busy flapping the pages. So I'd like you to just listen to the scripture. But you have the references so you can look it up later. And I encourage you, please do that. Don't take my word for things. If I make a mistake or have a, something wrong, let me know. Okay? Uh, I don't get to rewrite scripture even though I'm a pastor. So, the first thing is that we're going to look at our authority in, our authority over, and our authority to. And the first thing is our authority in, it's all in Christ. Amen. We have no authority in any other name, right? There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. So, our authority is in Christ. John 1 Verses 10 to 13 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, speaking of Jesus. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus came as the one and only Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, with the full authority of the Father. This is, this is authority, and I believe that people in the Jewish first century understood this. That's why the Pharisees were so against him when he said, I and the Father are one. Because in their mind, from a legal perspective, the Son could speak for the Father. And in this case, the only son, so he was the eldest son, if he is the only son. That his authority is he could speak for God. And what's so important about that is without that being established, we would have zero authority. We talked about it this morning quite a bit. Without the shed blood of Jesus, without the fact that he lived a sinless life, yet gave his life willingly for us, we would have nothing 
uh, to, to have any authority in. All of our authority is in what Christ has done for us. As reborn children of God, we have been transformed. And that work of transformation will continue until we see him face to face. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How do we relate that to authority? <laughs> you have authority in Christ over Satan's accusations of who you used to be. And, and does he ever try to remind us? Anybody identify? Who do you think you are? You, you're talking awful big for someone who used to. Yeah. You have authority over that voice that Satan tries to put in your head because of Jesus. The old has passed away. All things have become new. Amen. We get a do-over. Aren't you glad for that do-over? Amen. You've had an identity change. You're no longer a child of the world or a child of the devil. You're no longer the drug addict. You're no longer the alcoholic. You're no longer the person with the eruptive temper. You're no longer the person that used to yell and scream at your kids. You're no longer the person that was on your way to hell. You've been changed. You're now a child of God. If you identify as just an old sinner, you're not walking in your authority in Christ. With all respect to Bill Gaither, I'm not just an old sinner saved by grace. Not. Sorry. Too many people walking around, oh, I'm just an old sinner. <laughs> well, that's too bad. Because the Bible says you're brand new. Amen. This is the authority we have only because of Christ, only in Christ. We have the authority in Christ to the degree to which he has already spoken on the subject. We have authority in Christ to proclaim the truth of God's word. God's word is clear, you can be clear. If God's word isn't clear, you don't get to make up new rules and tell God what to do, right? We're in, we're, we're in Christ, we have authority in Christ, but we only have the authority as much as God's word tells us. It doesn't give you room to be a bully. It doesn't give you room to be self-righteous. It doesn't be, give you room to say, I'm in charge here, everybody else sit down. It doesn't give you room to do that gives you room to have authority in Christ with an attitude of love because God is love. Amen. Everything that God did for us, he did because he loved us. Everything Jesus accomplished was because God loved us so much. So if you are walking in the authority of Christ, you will exemplify the love of God. Yep. Matthew 16, 19. Jesus is speaking to Peter when he told him uh, that that. He answered the question correctly, right? Uh, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He started with Peter. Now, let me give you a, a more literal translation of that, that verse of Scripture from Young's literal translation. You've got to really listen but I'll, I'll summarize it then. And I will give to thee the keys of the reign of the heavens. And whatever thou mayest bind upon the earth shall be having been bound in the heavens. And whatever thou mayest loose upon the earth shall be having been loosed in the heavens. And that means this. If you're in Christ, whatever you do not permit on earth is what is not permitted in heaven. Heaven came first. So we're best to understand that you can bind whatever has already been bound in heaven. That means you don't permit it. And loose, it means whatever heaven permits, you can permit on earth. Those are the bumpers and guardrails for us. We don't have to ask questions. I wonder what God really thinks. Well, we have a good understanding of what's permitted and not permitted in heaven. And, and God's desire is that we operate in that freedom, in that authority, 
on earth. We, we know that things are going to get bad, that it's going to culminate in a seven-year tribulation period. That's the way we read it, right? And eventually Jesus is coming back to a restored Eden. But until that time, we're still called to bind here on this earth what's already been bound in heaven. What does that mean? It means we can take authority over some things. Yeah. We're not helpless. We're not helpless. Amen. Let's move into authority over. What do we have authority over? Well, first of all, principalities and powers. Ephesians 6, 12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We think of heaven as where God lives, but the heavenly places would be the realm that is not physical, but it's not where God lives, it's where all the, the battles happen. And we know, according to the Word of God, especially Ephesians 6, that there are battles that are ongoing, demonic forces that would seek to harm children of God. And listen, the closer you get to Him, the more your enemy is going to pester you. So, if you are suffering over this idea that why don't I have authority over my thoughts, it's because Satan is attacking you where he does the most damage. You can have authority over your thoughts, Amen. but to expect those thoughts not to come is a waste of time. You get a hold of those things. You say, in Jesus' name, I do not permit that in my life. Yes. We have authority over principalities and powers. Verse 13 of that same passage. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Sometimes you just got to stand. You say, I will not give up one other inch of ground. I stand. Amen. We have the authority in Christ over principalities and powers of evil. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's two part. Submit and resist. If you try to resist without submitting, you'll lose. Yep. If you submit first, you are able to resist. Contrary to what you may think. Contrary to what the world tells you. You are more than just human. You are Holy Spirit filled yes. children of God yes. if you're trusting in Jesus. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Is that talking about salvation? No. That's every day. Yes. I come under the authority of God in my life in everything that I do. If you submit before God, you can resist the devil and he will flee. You have authority. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Who, what's the pronoun? It means false prophets and the spirit of Antichrist. I encourage you to read a little bit back into that before that verse. So, little children, you are from God and have overcome false prophets and the spirit of Antichrist. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Little children, I love that, the way it's rendered. And, and John is an old man, he's writing to uh, Christians, and he's probably thinking, I'm not going to be here for long. I want them to understand. Little children, think about it. A little child, as we think of physical children, there are some things that little children can do, but there are some things they can't do until they're older. Is that fair? John is speaking spiritually of little children, and he says, even, even young Christians, even little Christians, let me tell you something. You are from God, and you have overcome all of these things. Amen. Not you will, Thank you, Lord. you have. You have authority. You have authority over demonic spirits and sickness and disease. You know, when Jesus walked this earth, he, he gave uh, authority to groups of people like this. Small, medium, everybody. He 
give you some examples of that. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 1, he called his 12 disciples together. And he called them and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. It's when he sent out the 12. This is before Calvary and Pentecost. Huh? Jesus gave them this authority, a limited group of people for a limited period of time because he wanted to get them used to what was, what was it going to be like when he was gone. You know, if you bring somebody under you to learn, which is so important, whatever we do here, we should always be looking to bring other people in. Always. So he's bringing them in and he says, okay, for this limited time, I'm going to give you authority. And he didn't give them authority to go pray for people. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. Did you catch the difference? He wasn't saying, oh God, if you can, please make the spirit go. It's not like that. He gave them authority to cast them out. A little bit later on, he widened the scope of authority. Luke 10, 8, 9, he sent out the 72. He says, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. And we think, oh, they could actually say that just because they are in their presence that the kingdom of God has come near to them. There are people that would hear that and really understand it and say, oh, I'd have no right. Who do I think I am? Your child God, that's who you are. And Jesus said when he sent these 72 out, remember, before Calvary, before Pentecost, and he said, you go out and heal the sick, and you tell the people, the kingdom of God has come near you. I wouldn't advise going down to Walmart this afternoon and walking up to a complete stranger and saying, the kingdom of God it's just come near you. <laughs> it may not be the best way to win friends and influence people, but it's, it's what we carry. That's the authority that we carry. And then Jesus spread it even further. Right before he ascended, Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. You knew I was getting there, right? And these signs will accompany professional pastors. Oh, wait. These signs will accompany the prophets. No. These signs will accompany the really, really spiritual elite. No. These signs will accompany those who believe. Yes. How many believers in the room today? These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Listen, I don't understand all I know about this. <laughs> I don't. I don't comprehend a lot of this. I haven't picked up the scorpion lately. But I know that the potential is there and that the authority is there. With, with every bit of humility, I can say that God has given me and you as believers in Christ authority because He's getting ready to ascend. Do you think he's going to limit it to the people that are hearing him right then? Of course not. This is a, a, a wrinkle in the fabric of time. Everything changed with Jesus. Yeah. Amen. We have authority over, and I'll add something to this, in, or in spite of obstacles. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, truly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. I know it's been abused, but it doesn't make it any less true. In spite of obstacles, James 1, 2 to 4, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Not, you know, just grit your teeth and hang on. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Even in trial, 
steadfastness grows. That's, that's a fruit of living our life for Jesus. That's a fruit of being in Christ. Steadfastness, determination. And without steadfastness, we cannot be complete. And without trials, we can't develop steadfastness. So we have authority even in trouble, even in opposition. We have authority over distractions, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, there it is again, that joy, the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I believe that joy that was set before Jesus is us right now, knowing that on the other side of this agony that he was going through was going to be a people called the church. And this called out assembly of the living God was going to be empowered to not just endure, but overcome. This is the design, the, the, the way we are meant to live. Now we get to the authority too. You know, we start with this whole thing about what do I get to do? And sometimes we miss the first two, but there is a two. And here are some of the things that we as believers in Christ have given authority to do. If you're born again, you have the authority to operate in spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. We are designed to operate far and above our natural talents and abilities and preferences. We are designed to operate in a whole other realm that, that people from the outside looking in would say, this is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit because I know that person and they could never do that. Most pastors started out life not wanting to speak in front of people. Clay, Clay says, amen, brother. Right? We're, we're all a little introverted. We do our best to not appear that way. But we are. Romans 12, 6, first part of 6 says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Romans 12, the motivational gifts. That means if God has given you this, use it. Do you know it's disobedient to not use what he's given you? And he's not giving it for you. He's not giving it so you look cool or so you stand out. He's not given this so that you can uh, amass trophies. No, not at all. It's for other people. And there's more spiritual gifts the Bible talks about. Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. And let me tell you something. Not all of those apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers went to Bible college. Not all of those have reverend before their name. Not all of them are in full-time ministry. Matter of fact, I'd say most of them aren't. But God has called people to, to operate in these, these gifts. These are gifts to the church in the form of people. And we have the authority to operate in that. That can be a difficult one sometimes, especially if people want to give us a title. We've got to receive it humbly and simply walk in that. And we've also given the authority to be like Jesus. Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. People get hung up on that predestined word. Those of us from a camp that doesn't believe in predestination and the, the, the way John Calvin interpreted it, what this is saying, that God knows who is going to be saved. And those people, here's what he's designed for them. He designed for them to be conformed to the image of his son. God, God's perfect design is that we look like Jesus. Amen. Can anybody do that on their own? No. But you know what? That's the way we're designed. 
That's the goal. When we see him face to face, the Bible says we shall be like him. Does that happen just when we get to heaven? No, it starts now. It's the sanctified life. It's being able to say no to distractions and understand what you have authority over. You have, think about this, you have been given permission to be like Jesus. So if you need permission to, to live holy, I'll give it to you now. Because God gives you permission to be like Jesus. It's his plan for you to be like Jesus. That's the authority that we carry. We've also given the authority to witness. Acts 1.8, before Jesus ascended. You remember the disciples said, is, is, it, is now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, uh, just don't worry about that. Here, here's, here's, what, here's what I want you to know. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We have been given authority to witness. It should never feel like a task because we have authority to tell other people about Jesus. It goes further. We have the authority to make disciples. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, we call it the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, stop. Maybe we'd understand it better if we said, because of that, go. Mm -hmm. Jesus has all the authority in heaven and on earth. <coughs> and then what did he do? He told his disciples, so go. Yeah. And here's what I want you to do. Go and make disciples. That means followers of Jesus. A disciple has discipline in it. We don't always like discipline, but man, it's... It's all part of being a disciple. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. If he just meant the disciples that day, why in the world would he say, I'm with you always to the end of the age? Has the age ended yet? No. Are any of the original disciples living? No. He intended that for all who would come after them. Three things. We have the authority to make disciples, we have the authority to baptize, and we have the authority to teach. When we do water baptisms, there are some times that there are people that are being baptized who are kind of a disciple of someone besides me. Let them baptize them. There's nothing that says I have to be the one to do that. We, we've made this man-made stuff just way too difficult. You have the authority to make a disciple. You have the authority to baptize people. You have the authority to teach them. We also have the authority to approach God. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest, that's Jesus, who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been, sorry, who is, I'm trying to multitask, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Think about that. There's no temptation that has come into your mind that Jesus hasn't had, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have the authority to come into the throne room of heaven boldly, respectfully, but boldly. Get that? Sometimes we have to physically walk to make it, to make it hit home, at least I do. And I'm coming before your throne. Think about that. The one who created everything, the one has, that has all the answers to when did the dinosaurs live? <laughs> the one that has all the answers to how can there be something from nothing? The one who has all the answers to how could space be endless? The, the one who has all the answers to how could the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how could they have always existed? The one, that, the one that is smart enough to give an answer to that says, come, I want to hear from you. God help us. God help us if we ever just go through the motion. 
God help us. We're authorized to be Christ's ambassadors. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. It's a ministry of reconciliation that God has given us to reconcile others to him. Wow. He did all the work and let us in charge. How about that? We got to walk in that kind of authority. We have been made priests to God. Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are authorized to represent Christ. We're authorized to minister to others. Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Come along, somebody. Side somebody, empathize with them, pray for them, encourage them. You don't have to tell them what to do. You just have to be with them. Like we started off this morning, I'm going to come alongside of you and lift you up. We're called to do that. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Confess your sins to one another. Find some close people, close friends that you can talk to, that you can deal with some of these things that are on the inside. So be the one. Be the one. Throughout history, there have been men and women who didn't think themselves capable or worthy of becoming leaders in the kingdom of God. We start with the Bible characters, Abraham, Moses, Jeremiah, all the prophets. Peter, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Oh, no, that sounded good. <laughs> the apostles, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Augustine, Eusebius, Ignatius, Jerome, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Wesley, Whitfield, Edwards, Moody, Evan Roberts, Charles Parham, William Seymour, A.B. Simpson, Phineas Brzee for our Nazarene friends, William Brant, Smith Wigglesworth, Amy Semple McPherson, Orr Roberts, Catherine Coleman, Reinhardt Abanke, David Cho, Anna Hummer, <laughs> Melody Weitzel, Dan Cluck, People that whenever they were called, they thought there's just no way that God can do something great with me. And I got to tell you, that's the best way to come before him. Amen. But we come before him humbly, but we, all, we, we do not forget the authority that he's given you in Christ. Matthew 11, 11. Right after Jesus had uh, said, uh, they were speaking of John the Baptist, and he said, what do you see in John the Baptist? A prophet? He says, yes, indeed a prophet, but more than that. He says in verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. I want you to let this sink in just a little bit. John the Baptist would have been the last Old Testament prophet the last prophet of the Old Covenant, preparing the way for Jesus. And Jesus says, of, of all of the prophets who came before, John the Baptist is the greatest. Think about some of those people. I mean, Moses was considered a prophet. How about Elijah and Elisha? These weird people that did incredible things. I mean, Elijah and Elisha were weird, man. But, but, but people that God uses like that usually are. I want you to understand something. That someone who comes to Christ today is greater in the kingdom of God than they. Mm. Says something about our potential, doesn't it? Yeah. Says something about our comfort level. Nice padded orange pews. <laughs> nice warm building. 
we've made coming to church the end all. Coming to church is just something we do because we want to. It's not the end all. It's not being a disciple. Anyone can come into a building. Think about the authority that you have in Christ. Why not? Why not? Why not here? And why not now? Why not? You remember when the, the, that, that line became popular a little while ago when the, the uh, revival was taking place at Asbury? Why not here? Why not now? So, why not? You're waiting for revival to come down like a snowflake? Just get revived. Do it. Do it. Purpose in your heart to shake off the things that don't matter and to take on the things that do. Understanding that your being is the most important thing. Be who God created you to be. I'm going to ask us to do something this morning. You got a little warm up earlier. I'm going to ask you to do something. Let's stand together. And maybe there's somebody here that you hear all this stuff and it seems so far that you need someone to agree with you that what I have just described, what the Bible teaches about who you are in Christ, you need someone to come alongside you to agree with you that this is true. Are there some here that would say, I'm not quite there yet, that I can really get a hold of my authority in Christ? I'd like someone to come pray with me and agree with me. Okay, let me get someone up here. There you go. Anybody else? Not quite there yet. It's okay. It's okay. Can I tell you? I said it before. I don't understand all I know about this. There's a mystery, folks. There's a mystery in me. I know that there's so much more that that I'm that I have authority over. Kathy, somebody pray with Kathy. We're, we're family, right? I know that there is so much more that I that that in me is the potential to be able to tell a demon to go and it goes there's something in you that has the ability to walk up to someone and with cancer and say I stand against this cancer in Jesus name and it goes the potential is there it's always there for a child of God is there anybody besides me who doesn't think they quite understand all that can we pray for one another can we get together and, and find somebody really seriously go ahead We'll, we'll have you at 412. Is that you? Can we get together and agree with one another and strengthen one another? Maybe there's someone here that has the sickness in your body and you're like, I, I know I'm not supposed to have this and, and I know that God is fully able. You need someone to agree with you about a sickness in your body. Just raise your hand. We're going to come and we're going to pray with you. If you feel led uh, to come alongside somebody and say, I want to speak life, and minister to you right now, we have the authority to do that. You can be the one to step up and step out. Maybe you've never done it before. Maybe this is brand new. Well, guess what? There's, there's a first time for everything. Huh? Take a few minutes. Let's just find a, find a place where we can agree with somebody else. Speak life into someone. We have the authority to do so as children of God.